Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Stephen, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Professor Diana Franklin from the Department of Computer Science. Professor Franklin leads the Computing for Anyone Lab and co-leads the Q12 Partnership, focusing on teaching computer science and quantum computing to young students and creating equitable learning experiences. She's here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. All right, Professor Franklin, thank you so much for joining us on the course today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How about you? I'm doing well. Thank you. So before we uh, get get into your story, uh, can you just tell our listeners, uh, you know, what your position is and, you know, in layman's terms, uh, what it is that you are uh, researching for? Yeah. So I'm an associate professor, which means I'm a little bit in the middle of my career. And I do research on how middle school students and other novices learn computer science concepts, as well as quantum computing concepts. So we look at what their interests are, how can we connect to their interests, and how can we design learning experiences so that middle school and uh, up through early undergraduates can not only learn the technical material, but really enjoy doing it. All right. And um, just one, one more sort of preliminary question. Um, can you just uh, sort of quickly give us an overview of your career, like, you know, starting an undergrad and, and up through presence? Um, what, uh, what institutions have you attended and, and, and what roles have you held? Yeah. So I went to college at University of California, Davis, and I majored. I started out majoring in math, but uh, because I wanted to be a teacher. And then I decided that if I was computer science, that would give me flexibility. I could either be a teacher or I could have a financially stable career in a company. So mm -hmm. I switched to computer science and always sort of was undecided which way to go. Uh, and then I ended up, by the time I graduated, I felt like I'd learned a lot, but there just I felt like there was so much more to learn. So I decided to get a PhD. I first went to University of Illinois and got my master's there. And then I actually came back to Davis to uh, finish my PhD. And I specialized in computer architecture which is chip design. And even as I was getting my PhD, I had enjoyed my summer internships. I did two summers at Hewlett Packard. And so I figured, well, if I don't get a job in academia, I'll still be happy in industry uh, because I really enjoyed it. But it's harder to get jobs in academia. So I first went for jobs in academia. And I didn't know whether I wanted a research school or a teaching oriented institution. And so I applied to both. And I just really loved uh, the first job I chose, which was Ca at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And so I was a professor there and they, it's a primarily undergraduate institution. So we had no PhD students. I did research uh, with professors at research universities as opposed to having a full research group myself. And then I got to really focus on teaching and all of the other professors. We would talk about teaching and lunch together. It was such an amazing educational environment. And my plan was that after I got tenure, I would switch to computer science education research. So instead of researching about um, building computers, I would research about how kids learn computing concepts. And so that's what I did. And then I got married uh, and my husband worked uh, at UC Santa Barbara. And so I ended up getting, being able to get a position there. Uh, and I was a teaching oriented position. So I wasn't a traditional research faculty member. I was a teaching faculty member. Uh, and that's when I started really taking off with the computer science education research because they have a school of education. And I started working with a professor there in education. And we took her education expertise and my computer science expertise. And I completely fell in love with computer science education research. I would think about it as I was falling asleep. I would think about it in the shower, just all the things we could build and how much fun the kids could have and how should we be doing this? And so uh, eventually my research program outgrew my position because as a teaching position, I had double the teaching load and double the service load of a research professor. And so my husband and I went on the market and that's how I ended up at University of Chicago. So now I have, now I'm tenured again in computer science education research. So I had to go through, I sort of had to restart my career and go through that process again. And so, uh, but now I get to do what I fell in love with, which is computer science education research. Cool. Yeah, that, that's really interesting uh, to make that uh, 
uh, that leap, uh, you know, kind of midstream. And uh, I want to get into that, but uh, I also want to back up further into your biography. Um, you've used the word uh, teach or teacher or teaching uh, many times. I lost count <laughs> in that last answer. And uh, I'm curious, I mean, was that always uh, somewhere in your mind? Uh, did, did you always want to be teaching? As long as I can remember. I can't remember any time where I wanted to be anything else. When I was in third, my mom was a teacher. When I was in third grade, uh, we, she had a teacher friend. She wasn't teaching at the time. And, uh, and that teacher had homework assignments to grade. And I was like, oh, can I help grade them? I mean, I can't <laughs> believe that I did that. But, but the teacher was like, okay. And so then she handed me all the math homework and I graded all the math homework for these first graders. Uh, and so I just, and I tutored students and I was a TA in summer math programs when I was in high school. So I just, I, my science project was on teaching and I just always loved teaching. And, uh, just by the way, I uh, see that you play soccer or have played soccer in the past. Um, the world cup is unfolding, uh, as we record this, uh, have you been watching? I don't watch soccer. I'm not a watcher. <laughs> I don't it. like watching sports and I don't like watching music performances i like <laughs> playing sports and i like playing in musical uh, performances and I, you might i would say that my sport profile is that of a dog in that i like any sport i have to chase after something so <laughs> frisbee or tennis or soccer or racquetball it just i'm i'm really into ball and thing sports <laughs> Yeah. Okay. You're, you're a retriever by nature. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Um, what can you tell me about your, your interest in math? And I guess, you know, how did that uh, evolve uh, into you know, computer science and eventually uh, your the specialty that you're in? Now? I always loved math. Math was always my favorite subject. And I always perceived myself to be very poor at writing and <laughs> reading and writing. Now I know that I'm not as bad as I thought I was. I mean, I have to write proposals all the time. I write papers all the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so my, my perception may, I was not as bad as I thought, but anyway, I thought math was my only strength and I loved it. So I knew I was going to do something with math. So that left, you know, I was either going to major in math or something in engineering and, and I was fine at science, but I just didn't love it. Like I loved math. Gotcha. So I, I think you did mention in, in that overview uh, the point at which you decided to go into academia. But can, can you take me through that decision a little bit more? Because uh, as you mentioned, you know, you had other uh, other options coming out of undergrad. Yeah. So it it sort of snuck up on me that I was always, you know, the reason I did computer science was so that I could get a job at a company and be financially stable because I came from a very a uh, financially unstable home. We we were below the poverty line when I was a child. Uh, and so financial stability was my number one uh, requirement out of my major. But the question of whether to do teaching or industry, I just knew that when I got my PhD, it, you, you can't go, or I don't want to say you can't go. It's very difficult to be at a company and then get a job at a university as a research professor. And so I knew which direction I could go. So I went first for academic jobs. And then if I either didn't get a job, then I would just go for industry. Or if I didn't get tenure, then I could just go to. So, I, so it was always my backup plan. But then I got a job and I loved the atmosphere at Cal Poly among the faculty. Like it was just an amazing group of people who love educating students and so it was it was an amazing experience to be there. And uh, looking at, you know, your uh, when you were working on your Ph.D. and, and your early career, who are uh, a few of the people whose support was really crucial to you during those times? Yeah, I mean, I think growing up, certainly my my parents both had college degrees. And so the expectation in our household was we were going to college. Mm -hmm. And because of our economic status, I felt I had to get a scholarship to college. So I made sure I got top grades and that that ends up making it so you can go to grad school. Right. I had a scholarship in undergrad that I had to keep my grades up for or I would lose. You know, so it's like it, it was sort of this thing where I always had to be the best or near the best for economic reasons, because I was scared of losing my opportunities. 
And because of that, that opened up so many more opportunities than I could ever have imagined. Uh, and so I really credit my family with sort of putting me on that path. Once I got into academia, my husband has been such an amazing support. We've gone on the job market twice because my job, my position was not uh, a regular research faculty member position. And uh, I had too many non-research responsibilities. And so he's just been so supportive, moved to, you know, moved to Chicago because of my desire to have a, a job that would allow me to do more research. And so, yeah, even on a day-to-day -day basis and major life decisions, he's been such a, an amazing support for me. I'm glad to hear that. And um, you use the phrase, we've gone on the job market. Would you mind explaining uh, to our listeners what the, the dynamics are of being uh, an academic who's married to an academic and, and sort of what it means to you know, look for a job and, and try to change jobs uh, when you are both looking to teach? Right. It, it is quite challenging. It's called a two-body problem. <laughs> and some universities are very, very good about it. Like Santa Barbara is very, very good about it. They, you know, especially if you're in, you're in the same department, sometimes it can be easier because the department already values both of you. And so they're able to negotiate with the university to get an extra position for the spouse. But other, but if you're in different departments, it can be very difficult because now the other department, you're asking the other department to take someone that the first department sort of chose. And so two body searches can be very, very difficult. And so we were very fortunate that we're both in computer science uh, and that he's also very established. And so one, there was one offer we had where I was the main offer and he was the spousal offer. And then at this university, he was the main offer and I was the spousal offer. So it just depended. Uh, getting an academic job is not about being the best. It's about being the best fit for what that department wants. And so even if you have two people, it's it's not like the one is the best. And so they'll get the first offer everywhere. It's just a question of fit. Right. Yeah. OK, that's uh, yeah, very good explanation. And you I mean, you know, you you gave us sort of, I think, the, the short form of this. But uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, your your initial research interests, um, what you worked on in your Ph.D. and how that has evolved uh, over the, the intervening years. Yeah, I started out in computer architecture, which which is loosely chip design. So if I were in industry doing that, I would work for Intel or AMD, something like that, maybe even Google. And after my PhD, I continued doing that until I earned tenure. But at the same time, I was very active in outreach events. And I started going to the computer science education conferences so that I was aware of the research. And then when I got tenure and moved to Santa Barbara, they explicitly wanted me to do computer science education research. And so I that was when I started writing grants, writing proposals to do research in computer science education. Even at that time, I was still working in computer architecture, but again, I wasn't leading a group, I was assisting. And so whenever they needed my expertise, I would be on on a particular project. And quantum computing architecture was one of the projects. And so throughout that time, I did more and more and more computer science education research and then less and less computer architecture research until recently I was only doing quantum architecture. That was the last thing I was doing in architecture and almost everything was in computer science education. And then five years ago, we proposed a very, very, very large grant on quantum computing and it's so large that it had a very major education and outreach component. So I started leading that uh, and I actually exited the quantum architecture research so that I could focus on quantum computing education research. And so we made an edX course for people who have no more than an algebra background. So if you've taken algebra, you can learn about quantum computing. And we've made zines, and now we're making a bunch of games that are uh, that feature zombies and werewolves and vampires and are aimed at middle school students. So I've gotten to do a lot of fun things. It's the first time I've been able to use my architecture expertise to do something in computer science education research. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, so, I mean, 
you you made this switch. If I remember uh, what what you said earlier correctly, you 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 know were on a tenure track and made a decision to switch focus. Which I mean, if our listeners uh, don't know, that's a uh, a pretty big risk that you were taking. Um, what was it about? you know, uh, going into uh, focusing more on education that, that made you feel like it was worth it? I mean, was, was there a, a moment or just sort of a, a feeling that you got where you were like, uh, this is really what I, I should be doing? Well, I think so. It's not that uncommon, especially to teaching or into institution. So Cal Poly was fully supportive of this switch. I could have stayed there and continued my career there. And so when you're at a, a teaching oriented institution, they value educational research. So it wasn't a huge risk from that perspective. And then when I switched jobs, I was also in a teaching oriented position. They wanted me to be doing that. So it was really that what happened was I loved it so much and was was growing the program that it was too much for the position I had. So then I needed to try to get a research position at a major research university, which was not even what I did the first time I had chosen a teaching oriented institution. So that is really the leap that was really unlikely uh, to succeed, which was me going from a teaching oriented position and jumping to a tenure track research position, regardless of my research area. That's a difficult jump to make. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I wanted to talk more uh, in just a minute about, you know, what, what you're doing now in that position. It sounds really fun. But uh, I'm also just curious, I mean, I know that you've had, uh, you know, brief experiences in, in industry and uh, outside of academia. And I'm wondering, like, what, uh, what lessons did you draw from that? And, and what, if any, impact do you think, you know, working outside of academia has had on your academic career? So I would say the value of my summer internships at companies was to find out what it would be like to be at a company. And I found out I really enjoyed it. I loved working on a team. I uh, had a good relationship with my manager. I enjoyed coding. So all of that was wonderful. And what that made it, what that did for me was that I knew that if something went wrong in academia, if I didn't get an offer that I liked, that's fine. I can just go get a job and I'll like that job too at a company. So it, I am very risk averse and it allowed me to not worry about whether I was going to get this job that is very, very hard to get. Because I knew that my backup was high probability and I would enjoy it. Okay, well, yeah, then that, that certainly sounds valuable in, in that sense. Okay, so uh, <laughs> you were talking about uh, creating games a minute ago. And uh, I, I really want to, you know, hear a little bit more about what you are, are actually doing in, in your current role. So, you know, I mean, uh, broadly speaking, I, I understand that you are working on, you know, developing ways to teach computer science to younger kids. But uh, yeah, can, can you just, you know, fill me in on, on what that really looks like? Yeah, my lab really focuses on the border between research and practice. So we design things that we're going to put in classrooms and use them as research vehicles because we believe in making this impact in the classroom. So Quander is a game environment that we're creating that has five mini games in it. And the game dynamics are based on quantum phenomenon. So all of these, you, you're just playing what seems like a normal game in a lot of ways, but it just happens to be that the game mechanics are intended to teach you something about quantum computing. And then we have some, as you get through the levels, you collect these rewards, these like cards, stickers, whatever you want to call them. And they have the connection between what you've been doing and quantum computing. But we also do, uh, I create curriculum or my group creates curriculum. We create learning environments for formal learning. The games aren't really for the classroom. They're more for outside of classroom for people to do. What, uh, what does research uh, in education look like? I mean, you know, I, I, I understand, I think, what the end product is, but how do you conduct this research and, and build these things? Yeah, there are many different types of research studies you can do. One type of study is to ask students questions about their thoughts sort of when they walk in the door to find out what does an 11-year-old know about X, Y, or Z that you want to teach them about? Like quantum, right? Do they know, have they even heard that word? Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that when you teach, you connect to their existing knowledge. And so we sometimes connect to unrelated knowledge, like things that are happening in their daily lives. But we also want to know what their preconceptions are about quantum computing so that we make sure we either address them or we build upon them. So that's one type of study. 
another type of study is we design something and it has learning goals and it has sort of engagement or attitudinal goals. And so we measure what people know before they interact with our system. And then we have them play or learn or do whatever. And then we have a post-assessment to see what they learned from that experience. So, uh, I mean, you know, you may have already touched on this, but um, what uh, what either in your own research or, or just in the field in general uh, has been, you know, surprising or, or exciting to you lately? I mean, you know, like what's happening that you uh, are, are excited about in your field? Well, certainly I'm excited about this zombie game, vampire <laughs> game. Like that's just, I can't believe that somebody pays me to make games. <laughs> and then, um, but I would say professionally, the thing I'm most excited about is we designed a learning strategy for uh, middle school, upper elementary students to learn by code example. Because if somebody puts a code example in front of you, like, well, what do I, what do, I do with this? I see some code. Mm -hmm. So we laid out the steps that you go through to learn by example. And we have, you know, pointed questions that get at the real meat of the material so that they can use that example to actually learn the concept. And the teachers from the very beginning were just blown away and loved it. And so I was really happy about that, but we didn't know if it worked, right? Just because the teachers find it a nice routine for the classroom doesn't mean that it's working in terms of learning. And so we actually had a set of six classrooms that used it in six classrooms that didn't use it. And they did all, all the same projects. And the positive results are were staggering. I, I could not even believe how much that it helped the students. And it, basically the student, all of the students at academic risk with this learning strategy, they did as well as the students not at academic risk in the control classroom. Wow, yeah. That uh, that has to be really cool to to see those results come through. Yeah, yeah. Just sort of going a step further, and uh, if if you don't feel like you have a, a strong answer to this, that's totally fine. But uh, is there anything sort of on the horizon that you are hoping you get a chance to pursue later in your career? I mean, are there avenues that that you think you might want to go down in the future? Right now, we're trying to get money for something I call entwine which is sort of, an, we have this learning strategy that has been shown to work, but it's separate worksheets or a separate tab in the computer. And we want to really integrate a lot of things into the coding environment so that it's much more seamless for the students. And, uh, and so the programming environment we use is very open-ended and, uh, and allows people to do a lot of creative self-driven things, but it's just really hard then to grade those and to try to figure out what the students really did. And so we want to integrate all of that to help the teacher, to make it easier for the student. And then once we do that, there are all kinds of interesting things we can do uh, to help the student and make it more fun for the student while they're working. So we're really hoping to get funding for that because I think it has so many interesting things to do with it that, are, that go beyond just taking these worksheets and putting them into the environment. That sounds very cool. Um, well, uh, you have mentioned uh, a lot of, you know, what sounds like very enjoyable stuff uh, that, that you get to do in your work. One question we've been asking people is, uh, what is the least fun aspect of, of this job? I mean, is there anything that you just don't particularly care for <laughs> in this role? I mean, I think um, luckily you Chicago students are by and large very diligent and mature. Mm -hmm. But, you know, whenever you're working with 50 students, random students, you get students who are going to complain about things that are normal practice. And so just dealing with that, that those negative, I don't enjoy negative interactions with students. And so I would say that is the biggest thing. And, and I think if you work at a large public school where the class sizes have grown significantly, uh, it's when I was at Santa Barbara, by the end, I was really enjoying my job less and less and less because your positive interactions don't scale. You can only have so many positive interactions with students, mm. but the number of negative interactions is dependent on the number of students because those you are required to respond to. Yeah. And so it, it just really took the love of teaching out of me. So that's the part I don't like about my job is, is the negative interactions. But uh, here anyway, they're, they're few and far between. 
So I really am mostly having positive experiences in my job now. Well, good. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. So I, I do, I have two more questions just to wrap up. One of which is, uh, what would your advice be for people who are considering entering your field? I would say my biggest piece of advice is that you should think about being collaborative instead of competitive because jobs in academia, a lot of people think, oh, I need to be the best. So I need to be better than all the people around me. So I can't work with them because that would share credit. Uh, but as we found out in our two body searches, it's not about who's the best. It's about fit. And so you want to be collaborative. And those people that you're collaborating with are going to be your friends and colleagues for the rest of your career. So it's really good to make friends and work together so that you can support each other through your whole career. Is it hard not to feel competitive, though? Because, I mean, you know, when, when you're um, I, right, I mean, you, you are sort of competing for for jobs and, and resources sometimes. Right. But then, I mean, as, as you said, you, you also can't uh, can't go it alone. Right. So there is, of course, there is some level of competition. It's really that if you folk, if you act as if it's just competitive, you are going to lose out. And so it's better to be more balanced. Yes, you need to lead something. And they need to lead something. Maybe you don't want to do everything together, but you should also be helping each other and collaborating so you can be on more projects and get more publications. So the advantages of being collaborative are significantly higher than the advantages of being competitive, where you work by yourself and try not to let other people steal your ideas. Or, I mean, you don't want people to steal your ideas, but you, you can do this in a collaborative way that helps both people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, um, okay. Our last question to sort of end on a high note is, uh, what do you find most fulfilling about what you do? The positive interactions and the positive feedback. We, we run professional development workshops with teachers and the teachers are all wonderful. When we, you know, put something out in the field and we get, get positive feedback from teachers. When I get emails from students a year or two later that say that what they learned in my class uh, positively impacted their careers, those are the things that I live for. Thank you, Professor Franklin, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.